Vision Financial Podcast with Luke Smith on Canberra's 2CC. Time to talk dollars and cents with Luke Smith from Envision Financial. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, mate. How are you? Really well, thanks for joining us. And of course, dollars and cents. Uh, we're going to do something a little bit different today. Mm. Instead of having just a topic, we're covering pretty much every topic you can think of. It is the most common questions that you get asked. Now, surely, Luke, people must ask you all the time, how can I make more money? Yeah, that's generally the first one. And then it's followed by, I want to maximise my return with no risk. So, you know, that one's not uncommon either. So. Of course, uh, those are a little bit um, in jest, but uh, when it comes to mm. the serious questions that people ask you, what would you say is the most common question that you get asked? Yeah, look, I think there's some general misconceptions that people have, and, and, and some of them we're going to touch on today. One we get all the time is, I'm going to retire now, so I have to sell all my assets in super and put the money in the bank. And in actual fact, there is no requirement for you to facilitate any change in your underlying assets of super. It's just a case of deciding how you now want to fund retirement. So people come in and say, I'd like to retire and I've now got to cash everything out. No, you can leave your superannuation where it is. There's nothing that says you have to take it out. And then you need to think about the broader strategic considerations of lump sum withdrawals or starting a pension and the associated tax benefits of doing so. So that's the first one that I'd I'd sort of knock on the head. So if people are asking, do I have to sell all of my assets? The answer is obviously no. But might there be some mm-hmm. circumstances where they decide perhaps it's a good idea to sell some and shift the uh, proceeds elsewhere? Yeah, look, exactly right. And this is where um, a, a general comment like that really needs to be sort of unpacked to take into account your situation, your broader strategies, and the key things that you want to try and address when you are leading into retirement, such as how do I fund my retirement? Do I need to buy a new car? Do I want to pay off a house? Do I need to buy a place down the coast? Do I have threshold issues in relation to how much money I have in super? And in those sorts of situations is where you're exactly right. People may wish to sell down assets in a pension because a pension is a tax-free structure, so you can avoid unnecessary capital gains tax in that instance. You may wish to pull some money out and put some money into a spouse's super fund to bolster that up to get under a transfer balance cap to maximise tax-free income, or to just equalise your estates. So there are a range of things that people need to keep in mind that could be ancillary to their primary objective, which then go a long way to helping them get the outcome that they're after with the greatest amount of flexibility of money. So the short answer is no, you don't have to sell all your assets, but consider your position. It might be advisable to do so depending on your circumstances. And that's that's exactly right. I, I say to people regularly, don't just do something because your friends did because you're not sure what their motivating factors were and you need to keep in mind what your why is and work towards that in in a controlled manner that allows you to get the best outcome possible. Now, here's one that I'll bet you get all the time and it goes like this. Now that I'm getting older, I really need to be more conservative, don't I? Yeah, I love that one. Um, Look, I totally understand where people come from because they've spent the vast majority of their working life accumulating for retirement. And depending on how old you are and the experiences that you've had, you may have gone through a GFC, you may have gone through COVID, you may have gone through the tech bubble, you may have gone through 15, 17, 18% interest rates. Depending on what your aversions are and what your understanding is in relation to risk, I find that people peg their risk profile to their retirement date. And when you unpack that part of the discussion, they actually realize that their investment time frame is almost to the day that they, uh, they leave us um, because you've spent your vast proportion of your working life saving for retirement. Well, when I ask people, what do you want in retirement? They say, well, I'd like to see my money continue to grow to offset inflation. That's generally the first thing people say. And then the next thing they say is, I need a really good income stream to underpin the pension I need to take out of my account to live the way I want to live. So if we've been working and growing our capital and generating income, I don't see any difference fundamentally in the risk profile of somebody that retires as they get older, because nine out of 10 people tell me they want those two things, capital growth and strong income. And you don't get either of those from holding huge amounts of cash and fixed interest assets. There is a place for it and you need to consider your personal aversion to risk. But but again, another generalization that you need to move to cash in retirement is actually 
as I say, if you're driving 40 in a 100 zone, um, there's going to be some people behind you that are rather annoyed on the road and you may be late getting where you're going. And being too conservative is a great illustration of that analogy. So this widely held perception that you need to be more aggressive when you're younger and more conservative when you're older, is that a complete misconception or is there some element of truth to that? Oh, look, I think there is some elements of truth to that because the things that concern older people is one of them is generally time. Um, and COVID, we saw last year, I had a number of people come in and tell me that they can't retire because the value of their portfolio has come off, so they need to keep working. And when you talk through that situation with someone and say, well, you're not going to spend all of your money in the next 12 to 18 months, we'll keep 12 months worth of living money in cash so that we're always looking 12 to 18 months in advance, and we can build up distributions through high-paying income assets, they start to realise that longer term is far more secure and they don't need to be as conservative as they realise. And I think on the, the other side of the spectrum is younger people, you, you have a lot of time, so you can afford to maybe be a little bit more aggressive. And when you talk to younger people, they say, oh, super, I can't get that for 30 years. So, yeah, have a crack with that because it doesn't affect their ability to live because they have wages and other personal assets to maintain lifestyle. So I think there's a time and a place to be aggressive and there's a time and a place to review how you feel the most important thing people can do is have an understanding of how they feel about risk, not what their partner thinks, not what their kid thinks, not what their mum thinks, not what the lads at work think. How do you feel when things go sideways and then invest to your um, preferences? At the same time, I would guess that perhaps even if you are younger, it's a good idea not to be overly aggressive. It's always worthwhile being prudent, isn't it? Yeah, look, again, I think everything in moderation. Um, for those out there that want to ride the lightning, that's completely fine. Just be aware that, you know, if the world does blow up, everything goes away in one foul swoop. If you don't want to do 180 in 100 zone, as I say regularly, there's nothing wrong with 160. The airbags may still go off, and, and, but you may not die. So just do something that you're comfortable with, both in a positive and a negative environment, because it's very easy to be bullish when things are strong. And I find that um, you end up handing out the Kleenex when, when things go sideways. Indeed. I love this next question. When I retire, I just pull, up, pull out all my super, right, and put it in the bank. Well, that sounds enjoyable, doesn't it? Yeah. And again, another misconception that people tie their investment timeframes to their retirement date and they don't actually understand through no fault of their own. They don't actually understand the retirement process and ways that you then go to use your accumulated super to start a pension um, and how you can draw income. I, I often get asked, well, how does this retirement thing actually work? Yes, I've stopped working. Yes, I'm not ironing five shirts on a Sunday night, but how do I now live? I, I get that one a lot and people's general perception there is, well, super's finished now because they tie it to their retirement date. I'm going to pull it all out, stick it in the bank and what will be will be. Um, when actual fact, it's, it's far from that. And as we said earlier, there's no reason to pull anything out. Um, you don't need to cease being in superannuation. And depending on what you're going to do from a work perspective, you may go back and contract. You may have a taxable government pension. You may have PSS, CSS, DFRDB, one of the defined benefit income streams. It may actually be advantageous to leave your money in super if you don't start a pension because you know the worst that will happen is you'll pay tax at 15%. And that may be lower than your marginal tax rate if you decide to work on a part-time basis. So again, don't assume, ask the question and have a general understanding of what your options are before you retire so that you can structure things appropriately. Yeah. These days, of course, uh, it's pretty much all about establishing a regular income stream from your pension fund after you retire. But it wasn't always that way. I mean, people were, once upon a time, commonly taking their super as a lump sum. Can you still do that if you want to? Yeah, look, 100%. The nice thing about meeting a condition of release or retirement is that you can basically do whatever you want. And I'll give you an example. Let's say we had a million dollars in our super fund and I retire on the end of December and I say, right, I'm going to go and pay off my place down the coast. I'm going to buy my wife a new car. I'm going to put a deposit on a house for my kids. You could go to your super fund and pull three or $400,000 out to do so and then start a pension with the balance. You could also start a pension with the entire super fund 
and then make lump sum withdrawals out of the pension as well. So the important thing for the listeners to keep in mind here is pensions and super are extremely flexible structures. And again, knowing what you want to do and doing it in the right manner can provide you with huge benefits in relation to the income that you receive, the tax on the sale of assets, as I said earlier, pension structures or pension incomes are tax-free over 60 and the sale of assets inside a pension is also tax-free. So there's no unnecessary capital gains tax. So doing things in a, in, in a prioritised manner using the legislation to your advantage can maximise a positive outcome and tick off all the boxes you want to do in retirement. So if you actually want to take it all out and just take it all as cash, you can do that if you want to, even though it may not be a good idea. 100%. Yep. No dramas at all. Yeah, if you want to take it down the casino and just get some chips and, 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 and spin the wheel, happy days. <laughs> oh, dear. No, don't do that. All right. Uh, this next one is pretty similar to the first question, but it's about starting a pension. So does that mean I need to sell my assets and start again? Yeah, another another misconception. People say, well, I'm moving from super to pension, so I'm going to sell everything down, I move it into pension, and then I buy new assets. That seems to be the general consensus. Um, and in actual fact, there is no underlying change or impact to the investments in your super fund. It is simply a change of structure that goes from a super fund receiving contributions, which we call accumulation phase, to starting a pension all we're putting on is an income hat and we're saying to the fund provider, hey, I'm not going to put any more money into this account, but I'd like to take some out and here's how much I want. So the underlying assets have absolutely no implications to the strategy whatsoever. There's no need to sell, rebuy, amend. You can restructure your assets depending on what you need in the pension phase, but there is nothing that happens to what you hold just by changing the designation of an account and I suppose it's the same as that first question. Uh, you, although you don't have to sell them, you can, if you want to, you can rearrange the uh, the assets to suit your needs. That's exactly right. And you just want to check with the provider that you're with. If you stay with them and go from superannuation to pension, then there's no change of asset. If you had some CBA shares, for example, in your super fund that you'd paid $20 for, um, selling them in pension phase would be very, very advantageous because there would be no capital gains tax implications. So using pension legislation to your advantage can be very advantageous. If you move from ABC super fund to XYZ pension, then that may trigger the sell down of assets where you're moving to a completely new pension provider. So just keep that in mind and make sure that the fund that you're with now gives you the ability to have those flexibilities long-term because you don't really wanna be jumping from provider to provider to provider because you are then forced to liquidate just to start from a new superannuation source. Okay, so it's always important to uh, be careful about those details. Now, this next one, I can't put money into superannuation once I retire, can I? Mm. Yeah, I love this one. This one's great. Um, when we're talking with people about how to maximise tax deductions and limit the tax payable on, as I mentioned earlier, defined benefit income streams, or let's say you pop back to work. Let's say you quit and then you get a contract and you go and work with your mates back in the department that you spent 35 years busting to get out of because that never happens. Um, you can actually throw money into superannuation. It has nothing to do with gainful employment. The bigger consideration when putting money into super is, am I of the right age? Do I need to meet a work test? And if so, can I? And then what are the limits that I can put money into superannuation under? depending on whether they're deductible or non-deductible. It actually has nothing to do with being gainfully employed and being able to put money into superannuation. Okay, the next of our commonly asked questions that people ask Luke all the time is this one, and this is a cracker. Should I have done this five years ago? Well, yes, you should. Yeah, this one's, this one's frustrating on my side of the table um, because we try and explain things to people sort of clearly and concisely. And I, I try and think about how I'd explain things to my mum because you don't get any prizes for confusing people. Um, and one of the nicest things some people come in and say is I just, I get the way you explain stuff. And this is, this one is really just pointing out that sometimes not knowing is far more expensive than paying to find out. And I see people's eyes roll back and I see the cogs in their head turning when 
we talk through a strategy that may save them three or four thousand dollars a year. And you can see them in their head go, I'm this old. I had this long. I could have done it for this long. I could have saved like 15 grand over the last five years, couldn't I? Uh, yes, yeah, you could have, but what you don't know, you don't know. So, yeah, just keep in mind that sometimes paying to find out what your options are can be far, far cheaper than the opportunity cost of not knowing or assuming you can't do something. Our next commonly asked question, if I am working, I can't have a pension at the same time, can I? For sure. No problems whatsoever. It just depends on what you're doing in relation to employment. So if you've retired from the workforce because you reached your preservation age or your retirement age under the legislation and you start an income stream and you then decide, hey, I've got an opportunity over here to get out of the house three days a week, you can go ahead and do that and you can receive wages and a pension at the same time. If you're over the age of 65, you can be working on a full-time or part-time basis. You don't have to retire at all and you can start an income stream from your superannuation, generally on a tax-free basis, depending on how much is in there, and have the best of both worlds in relation to your cash flow. If you haven't reached your preservation age, you can use what we call a transition to retirement pension where you want to remain in the workforce because you like your job, but you might want to do three days or four days a week instead of five. And a transition to retirement pension is a way of having salaried income and drawing from your accumulated super as an income stream within certain parameters um, to top up the wages that you lost having every other Friday or, or, or each week doing a limited number of hours. We're up to our final question, and Luke, here's here's the doozy. Can I really split my super to my spouse and get it when they retire? Yes, the answer is yes. It's 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 probably one of the nicest pieces of legislation for people that marry well. And by marry well, this strategy comes into play where there's a sizable difference in age. So super splitting legislation allows you to move up to 85% of your concessional or deductible contributions. And that means money that's come from your employer or money that you've put into superannuation and claimed a tax deduction for. So that could be a personal contribution or salary sacrifice. You have to do it at the end of the financial year and you can write to your fund and say, dear Mr. ABC Super, I'd like to move the contributions from my name to my spouse's name. Now, if I'm 40 and my partner is 50, they are going to reach their retirement age first. So you get the benefit of all of the deductions in your own name each year, so you don't miss out on anything. And then you can write to your fund, provided they allow this strategy, which most do, move that money into your spouse's name and bring forward your access timeframe to retirement by that 10-year age difference or whatever's relevant to you and your spouse at the time. So it's a great strategy to do over time because People need to remember this this is non-cumulative and if you don't do it each year, you can't go back and move previous contributions to a spouse outside of the previous financial year. So it's one you need to be doing in July every year. Keep moving money into the older person's name and then when the older person looks to try and retire, it's a great way for the younger spouse to either reduce work hours, have a couple of years leave without pay, and be able to access superannuation that they would have otherwise, in that example, had to have waited 10 years to get themselves. Okay, I find uh, the the whole idea is just a little bit complicated, but then, of course, that's why you're there, isn't it, Luke? Uh, You should really get some proper financial advice to uh, uh, maximise these strategies. Yeah, look, exactly. You know, my wife will be the first one to tell the listeners that I'm not good at much else. Um, my, My hands aren't good at building anything. It's... I'm a glorified foreman in in 90% of other situations. And, um, you know, I think that's it. I think you just need to stick to what you're good at and then outsource what you don't know because the opportunity cost of not taking advantage of something like the super splitting, um, the numbers there can be be in the hundreds of thousands over your working life. Um, And there's nothing more frustrating for me than someone coming in 
late in their working career and finding out that they've missed out on an opportunity like this where they could have got a huge amount of accumulated superannuation on a tax-free basis. So find out what you don't know and, and stay informed. Indeed. So on that note, Luke, where can listeners get more information? Yeah, so 62604749, office number still works. It's uh, diverted to a mobile, but we're, we're trading as normal just from home. Envisionfinancial.com.au is the website. Uh, We've got the podcast, The Strategy Stack at Luke Talks Money on iTunes and Spotify. And we've got the YouTube channel, Envision Financial Canberra. Uh, You can go on there and see all of the shows, watch it on your iPhone, take some notes. Um, And if listeners want us to touch on a topic or bring something up in in upcoming episodes, then just shoot me an email at luke at envisionfinancial.com.au and we'll try and work that into the, the program going forwards. Fantastic. Luke, we'll catch you next Friday. See you next Friday.